worst part about insomnia is the boredom. Nothing open except for the seedy places. Nobody awake except for the seedy people. Nothing to do except watch movies and eat sunflower seeds. Seriously, fuck insomnia. My sleep capacity generally comes and goes in waves, but the few weeks before I found Hal's were especially rough. There was no inciting incident. Just that general feeling of restlessness and anxiety that has become a familiar friend over the years. I tried all of the standard assists. Warm milk, old movies, cut down on my caffeine intake. All the usual things that people recommend but never work. Eventually, more out of boredom than anything else, I took to taking late night walks through the city. I worked a shitty job as a projectionist at a local movie theater. And on the weekends, I didn't often get off work until the last movie finished. And the city had long since wound down by the time I was free. The first week or two, I stayed towards the well-lit areas populated by the intoxicated, both rich and poor. But while the people watching was always good, I quickly grew tired of the relentless noise and began wandering off the beaten path. I'm not sure how I'd never noticed Hal's before. I distinctly remembered buying smokes at the dilapidated gas station across the street on several occasions, and I'm sure my eyes would have been drawn to the large storefront windows still brightly lit and welcoming at 3 a.m. The neon sign pronouncing it Hal's low-cost thrift and consignment glowed in garishly conflicting colors, except for the first as, which was burnt out. Of course I would come to realize that there were very good reasons I had never seen it before. But that first night I wondered if maybe I was hallucinating from sleep deprivation. I entered, of course. Even if I didn't feel the need to validate that the whole thing wasn't just a figment of my imagination. There was no way I was denying my curiosity. It was probably the smell that I noticed first. Kind of a combination of burning sage and rancid meat, but in a weirdly good kind of way. Best thing I can compare it to is a beach bonfire at low tide. The place was packed full of merchandise all displayed very neatly on row after row of shelving, but without any sign of clear organization. Knickknacks sat on the same shelves as old magazines and jumper cables. A bizarre collection of artwork decorated the walls, from shadow boxes holding sports paraphernalia, to Pink Floyd posters, to copies of famous Impressionist paintings. The wall furthest from the front entrance was actually just an unbroken line of doors. Each door was crafted in an entirely different style, and each painted a different color to create a full-length pride flag along the wall. In the center, the green door actually appeared to be an elevator, which really just raised additional questions. I began to browse the first aisle to the left of the front door. A full silver-plated dining set, a clown costume, a chainsaw without a chain, four cookbooks, a Super Soaker XP100 already filled with water, several fake antique-looking religious relics such as crosses and Buddha heads, and a full-length evening cloak that made me immediately start contemplating a career as a supervillain, if for no other reason than I would look amazing in it. I browsed several more aisles with a bemused smile on my face, as the truly eclectic inventory continued to defy any clear organizational sense until a gruff voice cleared its throat. I glanced up to see the shopkeeper behind the front counter staring at me. He was a medium-sized man but held a clear don't-fuck-with-me aura around him. His head was shaved bald and his arms and shoulders indicated someone who had spent more than a few years working in trades. Can I help you find something? He asked, his voice a low grumble that ran the line between professionalism and wanting to throw your ass to the curb. I shot him one of my patented disarming smiles. Not really, I'm just browsing. He continued to stare for a moment, his eyes probing as if searching for a way to sort me into one of the Jungian archetypes that all retail employees have for their customers. Incubus? He asked finally. Excuse me? Are you an incubus? He responded, his eyes still searching mine. No, Gemini, actually. Well, on the cusp with cancer, really. I didn't think people actually use the astrology pickup in real life. I gotta ask, do you get a lot of success with that one? With nostalgia being all the rage these days, going for one of the classic pickup lines is actually a brilliant idea. The corner of the man's mouth twitched just for a moment before returning to its painted-on scowl. 
That immediately put me at ease. Couldn't work the late night shift without having that hard shell of an exterior. But if I could touch a sense of humor, he probably wouldn't be throwing me out anytime soon. I don't get a lot of people coming in here just to browse, he said, his voice having moved slightly away from the gravelly grumble he was using before. Less Bob Dylan, more Bob's burgers. Most know exactly what they want by the time they lay eyes on this place. I shrugged. What can I say? I'm an impulsive sort. Hey, how much is this? I lifted up a snow globe that held what looked like a large hospital. The shopkeeper raised an eyebrow. Good eye. That's two hundred dollars. I whistled, immediately placing it carefully back on the rack. Pricey for a paperweight. Collector's item. There are a lot of stories inside that little snow globe. You could probably get a couple thousand from the right buyer if you're fine dealing with that kind of person. I take it since you're selling it for two hundred dollars, you're not fine with that? The corner of the shopkeeper's mouth twitched again. I could tell he was warming to me. I'm pretty sure you're not here for that old thing anyways. What am I here for then? I'm not sure yet. Keep browsing, I'm sure you'll find it. I did as I was told. An antique set of writing quills. What looked like a defunct Tesla coil. A compass and a sextant. A typewriter. A VCR. A few old board games I had never heard of and a few other raggedy children's toys, including an actual raggedy Ann doll. Nothing really struck my fancy until I was flipping through a rack of clothing and came across a treasure. I delightedly snatched it up and approached the front counter, placing it in front of the shopkeeper. He raised another eyebrow at me and I beamed a smile at him in return. I've always wanted one of these, I chortled. The shopkeeper shook his head and pressed a few buttons on the archaic register. Not Faye then. Never met a fay with a decent sense of humor. For the white t-shirt with I'm with stupid written on it. That'll be a buck fifty-three. I fished a handful of coins out of my pocket and counted out exact change. He took it and sorted the money into the correct slots. He looked back up at me and shook his head. This has got to be the dumbest sale I've made this year. I'm not even sure why that was on the rack. Hey, I'm not complaining, I said pulling the new purchase over the shirt I was already wearing. Did you just open? I walk by this area pretty often, and I'm sure I've never seen you here before. The man's smile came out fully into the open. Yes and no. We've been in business for a long time, but I guess you could say we're new to the area. Well, I hope you stick around for a while, Hal. I said, nodding with feigned understanding as I extended my hand. You've got a bunch of weird shit in here, and there aren't many other places for me to go shopping at this time of night. Butch, the shopkeeper replied, shaking my outstretched hand. Excuse me? My name's Butch, not Hal. What the hell would the owner be doing working the front counter at 3 a.m.? I threw my head back and laughed. I stand corrected. Butch grinned. So not an incubus, not a fay, not a vamp. What the hell are you doing in my shop? I raised an eyebrow, buying vintage clothing, apparently. No, seriously, what's your deal? Shapeshifter? Wendigo? Cannibal? Dude, I've worked enough retail to know all about the normal customer archetypes, but I think you've lost me on these. Is a shapeshifter one of those shoplifters who keeps showing up in different clothes like they're actually fooling anyone? Butch looked at me in perplexity. But a little bell rang announcing the arrival of another customer before he could continue his line of questioning. We both glanced towards the door instinctually, and I suddenly also began wondering what the hell I was doing in this store. The woman who had just entered was tall, disturbingly tall. At least that was my first impression. I soon realized, though, that she wasn't actually tall. She was just floating a solid two feet off the ground. She wore a long, pale white and semi-transparent dress that fell clearly past her feet and dragged gently on the floor. A white veil was pinned to her unkempt mane of dark hair and spread across her face. That veil did nothing to disguise the bloodshot and sorrowful eyes, the broken nose, nor the mouth that hung open to the center of her chest, leaving a large black void from her cracked and broken top teeth to well past her neck. I recoiled in horror, slipping and falling directly onto my ass 
before scooting myself back until my back hit a rack of shelves and a hairy, taxidermied hand fell onto my lap. I held up it up in preparation to do battle should I need to. The specter, however, paid me absolutely no mind. She merely glided down one of the aisles, raised her hand to delicately select something off a shelf, and then floated back up to Butch's counter. Evening, Maeve, just the usual? Butch asked casually. The woman's cavernous mouth seemed to open wider and a reverberating moan began to vibrate my soul. It wasn't loud, but it suddenly reminded me of the sound I heard my mother make over my grandfather's deathbed when I was nine years old. All right, gorgeous, it's 4.50. The woman in white reached out a hand limply and dropped a handful of crumpled bills on the counter. She then turned and slowly glided out of the door. My shaking hands continued to point the furry limb at her long, past the point she was out of sight. Throat lozenges, stated Butch. I swept the leg to point at him, my heart still racing and my eyes wide. Butch seemed unconcerned. Maeve comes in every night for a pack. Her work leaves her throat pretty sore. I'm not sure if they do much good, but it's always the regulars who keep a business afloat. That was a fucking banshee, I almost screamed. Butch's eyebrows raised as though impressed. Wow, he said. I'm impressed. Most humans wouldn't recognize one on sight. Hey, could you stop pointing that thing at me? They can get a little unpredictable if you're not used to them. I kept my impromptu weapon trained on him for another moment before allowing my hand, still tightly clenched, to fall into my lap. I continued to breathe shakily for another moment and tried to get my head straight. I'm sorry, I said once I felt like I could speak without screaming. That was really not something I expected to see tonight. What the fuck, Butch? Banshees are fucking real, and they come in here every night for pharyngitis treatment. What the fuck is this place? I realized my voice was starting to gain volume again. I stopped, swallowed, and took another raspy breath. Sorry, I said again. I've never reacted well when I get really scared. Believe me, I wish that didn't happen to me, but the thing still clasped in my hand suddenly lurched. I curiously glanced down at it, only just then fully noticing what I had been clenching in my fist. Fuck, this is a monkey's paw, isn't it? Yeah, you may want to put that down before you make another wish, said Butch, an amused smile on his face. Why, what did I say? Still scared? Of what? Oh right, ugly banshee chick. Nah, I'm good now. Why do my pants smell bad? Butch rolled his eyes. Go ahead and grab a new pair. No charge. Nice. Can I use your bathroom? He nodded towards the far wall of the shop. Purple door. I'd avoid opening any others if I were you. Spoil sport. Is that elevator real? Yep. And no, I'm not answering any follow-up questions until I can't smell you anymore. Ten minutes later, I was feeling much cleaner, if slightly chilly. In my newly bought I'm with stupid t-shirt and newly gifted cum slut booty shorts. I must have been starting to grow on Butch because other than another twitch of his mouth and slight shake of his head, he didn't much react to my change in style. So you're actually just straight human, aren't you? He asked ruefully. I can't think of another species that would so flagrantly disregard their own self-respect. Never seen the video of the otter raping a decapitated fish head, have you? You know what I mean. Even the blood orgy folk will still show up in something tailored, at least. Butch! You just had a floating girl in here wearing funeral clothes. Versace. Maeve's taste is old-fashioned, but always quality. I paused with my mouth open before shutting it slowly. All right, then. I guess I stand corrected. Should I change so I don't offend the blood orgy folk? I finally got a full laugh from Butch. What's your name, kid? Clear. Sorry? Clear. Middle name is Water. My parents were hippies, also big fans of revivals. Man, thought I drew the short straw when it came to names, but you've got me beat. So what? The shop bell rang again. Unlike with the previous customer, I felt not even the slightest twinge of fear as the latest monster strolled casually into the building. Six and a half feet tall and covered in reddish-brown fur, the man with the overtly canine face was sporting a cordial grin. The werewolf nodded casually at Butch and began strolling the aisles. Butch nodded back, 
and then raised an eyebrow at me as though interested in my newfound stoicism. Well, he asked, as if unsure whether or not I was going to shit myself again. I can't believe you gave me a hard time about my booty shorts and then didn't blink at that guy dropping werewolf dong. Butch grunted in satisfaction. Guess that monkey's paw was the real deal. I should bump up the price. You didn't know? He shook his head. It's good policy not to fuck around with a monkey's paw. Had a feeling it was legit, though. A lot of the other stuff we got from that particular estate ended up being pretty extraordinary. There was a pause. Such as? I demanded. Come on, dude. You can't drop that line and then not show off a bit. Butch laughed again and turned around to the display wall behind the counter. He pulled down a shadow box and laid it on the counter in front of me. Inside was an almost cartoonishly large revolver. Six chamber, but with a bulbous barrel that could have fired a ski ball. There were three huge rounds already loaded, but with no caliber that I recognized. You seem like the kind of guy who would appreciate this. He opened the case and gestured for me to pick it up. I did, immediately surprised by its apparent weightlessness. I spun it around my finger, gunslinger style, and leveled it harmlessly towards the doors at the end of the hall. The werewolf glanced up at me curiously for a moment before returning to his shopping. Love the way it handles, but I don't recognize the make. One of a kind, Butch said. They call it the Chekhov gun. I laughed. Seriously? Guess I have to fire it then, huh? Probably, but I wouldn't waste the ammo if you don't have to. Those three rounds are all there are left. How very hackneyed, I said, examining one of the rounds. These things seem a bit unnecessary, unless you're hunting kaiju. What are they? I've just taken to calling them MacGuffins. I've only seen it used once, during a debate over the bathroom being only for paying customers. One thing led to another and a full army of vampires ended up laying siege to the shop. Had to have been at least four or five hundred of them. Hal shot off a round from this, and it fired an actual sun. Gave me second-degree burns on every exposed inch of skin. But it fried every last one of those fuckers. Wait, it shoots a sun? I asked incredulously, cautiously setting the gun back on the counter. No, it shoots whatever it has to to get the job done, Butch explained. That makes no sense whatsoever. You do realize there's a werewolf browsing through old Megadeth CDs ten feet behind you, right? I turned around and locked eyes with the large hairy fellow for a moment. His tongue lolled out of the side of his mouth in a wolfish smile, and he winked at me. I mean, I get what you're saying, but I still think there's a big difference between ancient legends and a relatively modern literary construct. Butch opened his mouth to respond. But at that moment, the door slammed open with enough force to cause the lights to flicker. I glanced over my shoulder at the darkened doorway, noticing Butch's hand move to rest lightly on the Chekhov gun on the counter. The werewolf's hackles raised as a low growl began to rumble from his direction. The man in the doorway seemed human enough. If high-stakes lawyers could be considered human, that is. He was tall, but not intimidatingly so. His suit was well-tailored, his hair immaculate. The charming smile on his face belied the cold contempt in his eyes. Hey, Butch, he said, his voice a purring baritone. Hey, Az. Long time no see, Butch replied, his face devoid of emotion. Way too long. The man pulled a coin from his pocket and began rolling it back and forth across his fingers. Is your boss around? You know I haven't seen Hal in months, Az. Not since that incident with the purgatory delegation. Paychecks are still rolling in, though, so he's out there somewhere. If you find him, let him know I'm taking the fender for a Christmas bonus. As shook his head in feigned disappointment. It really would be in your best interest to help me track him down, Butch. You know the deal he made to run this place expired at the end of last month. Now my employer has a lot of respect for the old man and everything he's done over the years so he's more than willing to renegotiate the terms. Butch shook his head. You're not hearing me, As. I don't know where the guy is and I don't have any way of getting a hold of him. Come on, you really mean to tell me your boss can't suss out where he is? I'm starting to get why his little rebellion failed. 
Still not sure how he duped all you idiots into following his lead, though. Was that like a Trump thing? As his eyes narrowed. That's low even for you, Butch. I laughed involuntarily. I don't know, man, if the MAGA hat fits. Suddenly a force slammed into me, hurling me over the counter and against the wall behind the register. Shock shuddered through my body as a display hook pierced my shoulder. A flood of moisture spread down my back, and I immediately started feeling a little woozy, also a lot pissed. I jerked my head up to glare at Az. Motherfucker, I just bought this shirt! I felt myself reverse direction, flying off the wall and across the store. I flailed painfully as I soared, managing to tip over one of the racks before colliding with the werewolf. I couldn't help but marvel at how soft he was as we hit the floor and slid into another rack, bringing its contents down on us. I always envisioned werewolf fur as being more coarse, I thought as I waited out the falling inventory. Sorry, Jack, I muttered, rolling away from the werewolf and painfully climbing to my feet. Cool if I call you Jack. Never caught your actual name. Jack growled, shaking his head like a wet dog. I don't know why you have to make me hurt your friends before you tell me what I want to know, Butch. You know how much it pains me to hurt innocent bystanders. Butch was levitating over the cash register, his limbs shaking violently as he appeared to reflexively attempt to swallow his own tongue. I started grabbing anything within reach and throwing it at Az. I managed to score a direct hit with a tea kettle and an old computer mouse. But it was the lawn dart directly to the head that finally got his attention. Butch took in a raspy breath and fell to the ground as Az's head spun around to glare at me. His hand shot up and I felt my windpipe close. My hands instinctively went to my neck as I tried desperately to take in air. Idiot child. Rasped Az, his eyes appearing a dull red as the edges of my vision began to darken. Do you have any idea who you're? I lost the rest of his sentence as Jack launched himself into Az and the two of them flew into another rack. I fell to my knees, sucking in air and letting the world come back into focus. It sounded like Jack got one or two good swipes in with his vicious looking claws before he flew backwards again, crashing through one of the doors at the back of the store. What lay beyond remained unknown, as the door immediately reformed behind him, pulling back in its shattered wood until no trace of damage remained as his head came bobbing into sight over the racks. I got back to my feet. This whole lack of fear thing was really starting to grow on me. You can force choke me all you want, Vader, I snarled at him. We both know you're just a whiny little sand-hating bitch. As his face was filled with fury as he raised his hand to smite me again, suddenly Butch stepped between us. The Chekhov gun leveled squarely at Az's head. Az's look turned to one of contempt but his hand still lowered slightly. How many of those bullets are you down to, Butch? He asked. Two? Three? Are you really sure you want to waste one on little old me? What then will you use on the one he sends after me? Or the one after that? Eventually the big man himself will want to come. Better hope you still have at least one left for him. My eyes fell on another gun that had fallen onto the floor in the struggle one that I had noticed on my first walk through of the aisles. A stupid idea popped into my head. I reached down and grabbed it, cocking it loudly as I leveled it towards Az. Step aside, Butch, I growled. Butch shot a look back at me, saw what I held, and gave me a tight grin as he lowered the Chekhov gun and stepped out of my way. I squeezed the trigger on the Super Soaker XP-100 and sent a stream of water directly into Az's face. His scream was piercing as the smoke immediately started pouring off his melting face. I stepped towards him, continuously pumping more water as I adjusted my stream to any piece of exposed skin his squirming left exposed. The power of Christ compels you, bitch! I yelled as I stood over him, furiously pumping the squirt gun. Don't fuck with retail workers! Flesh fell from the demon's bones like really good barbecue ribs, bubbling into vapor from the floor. His screams became so high-pitched that I heard a few of the more delicate glass items in the shop shatter. I didn't let up on the stream of water until the plastic toy lost pressure and dribbled to a stop, as collapsed, his clothes falling into a pile on the floor as his body steamed away. I stood panting, 
feeling the adrenaline burning off my skin. My shoulder, forgotten during the fight, began to throb painfully, and the squirt gun slipped from my grasp. Did you seriously just use a Pulp Fiction line on me? I looked up at Butch in surprise and started to laugh. I mean, how often am I really going to have an opportunity like that? I just couldn't resist. He chuckled along with me. How'd you know that Super Soaker would work? You made it pretty easy to figure out what he was with all that boss's rebellion talk. And I thought with the kind of shit you have in here, there was a pretty decent chance that thing was filled with holy water. Anyway, if it wasn't, I knew you'd probably just look at me like I was an idiot and shoot him with the Chekhov gun instead, so you know, what the hell? He chuckled again and walked over to me to examine my shoulder. How's it look? I asked through gritted teeth. I mean, you're going to need stitches probably, but I don't think you're going to bleed out anytime soon. I nodded, then glanced over at the back of the shop towards the door Jack had disappeared through. Is he going to be all right? I asked. Jack? He replied. Yeah, he'll be fine. He's a pretty solid guy, has friends everywhere. I'm sure someone over there will put him up until he finds his way back. Holy shit. His name really is Jack? I thought I was just being clever. Nobody knows his real name, actually. He doesn't talk much. But most people end up landing on that joke eventually, so it's kind of just stuck. Ow, my self-esteem. I deadpanned. What's over there? Over where? You said someone over there will put him up. What's over there? Oh, that door leads to the back rooms. It opens up somewhere different every time, so you usually have to find another way back if you go through it. I nodded, not really understanding, but increasingly distracted by the radiating pain in my shoulder. Well, let me know next time you see him. I think I owe that guy a beer. Next question. Where's the nearest hospital? He grinned. Come on, I'll patch you up. Gotten pretty good at it over the years working this job. Only lost a couple dozen patients. I nodded and followed as he led to another door behind the cash register. He stopped with his hand on the knob. Oh, and remember how I was trying to figure out why you ended up finding this place? I think I figured it out. Want a job? I looked at him. I thought about the banshee, and the monkey's paw, and the werewolf, and the demon. Then I thought about the long series of dead-end, boring jobs I'd had up until this point. Do you have a dental plan? I've been looking at an old photo of my friends and I for a while now. It fell out from a volume of Hellblazer that's seen much better days. That comic itself has been collecting dust in the back of my cupboard for years now. It only ever saw the light of day again now with it coming out and move. It happened rather quickly, me moving out of my dad's and into my own place. I won't go into it here, but it had to happen. The quick move left me throwing most of my stuff into boxes without much regard for what it was. I just knew that I didn't want to go back so left nothing to return to. That's how an old comic I haven't even thought about in years ended up in my new house, and the photo inside of it. It was a photo of me and my friends. A photo of me and my friends from about nine years ago back when those were my friends. They were the kind of friends you have at ten years old, whoever lived closest. Looking back, I'm not sure we ever really got on. We even came up with a game that was pretty much just an excuse to fight each other in a park, copying wrestling moves we had seen on the television to see how much they really hurt. A lot. But at the time there was nothing else we wanted to do than get out of our houses and find any excuse not to go home. That's where the photo was taken, at the park in our estate, early on a Saturday morning. We all lived further out than the park which itself was surrounded by some abandoned houses, their windows boarded up with those metal sheets, with holes in them just big enough to see through. The park was small, with just a couple swings and a bit of astroturf grass that looked like it used to hold some climbing frames long yanked out. We weren't sure why those were the houses that got abandoned, when they seemed pretty similar to the rest of the council builds around us. It was exactly the same as my house, only a couple streets away. One of my friends, Billy, used to make up all sorts of different stories about what happened to them. Built on a sinkhole, home to termites, and most credibly, they were just really susceptible to damp and mold. They certainly smelled of it. 
That throat-catching smell used to waft over the park whenever the wind caught them. If I think about it too much about it, I can still taste it at the back of my throat. Despite that, it was still the best place to hang about back then. The underpass by my house was full of people smoking and hiding from the rain. A pastime we'd discover in the coming years, but currently wasn't that interesting. And the football pitch at the other side of the estate was the hangout of a group of people we never mocked too loudly. The park was the perfect place to sit and get bored. Billy was the perfect friend to have around when you were bored. It was him that came up with most of the games we played. But most importantly, he was always coming up with different stories about our estate. He got the nickname Grimm at school. One of the characters from a cartoon that was on at the time was called Billy. Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy. And with him being tall and lanky, it was a quick connection. To be fair to him, he turned it around to the idea that he was called that for always telling sick stories. It was such a good turn that we almost actually believed it. It was him, Amy, and myself in the park the day the photo was taken. On Amy's camera that she got for Christmas. It was a Kodak film camera, so we only had a few shots at it. The first had messed up when the camera fell, so we hoped that the second had turned out okay. Luckily, it did. The three of us making stupid poses lined up in front of the row of abandoned houses actually looks somewhat thought out composition-wise. We were sitting around admiring it when Billy started telling his story. The story about the gray man. The story seemed to come from nowhere. Billy suddenly finding this burst of motivation to start speaking. As he told it, the gray man was an older guy, around 50 or so, who would watch people on the street. Amy and I laughed at him. An old man watching you was a bit weird, but we've defiantly seen weirder. The week prior, I had saw a guy arguing with his dog outside of the corner shop, but Billy persisted. That's probably why I still remember what he supposedly looked like to this day. The detail that he went into was a lot, even for Billy. He said that he had seen him everywhere he went recently. He was a few blocks down from the bus stop beside the corner shop fence and standing alone in the field next to our school. He was always there, standing, never following, but always watching. Whenever he tried to get a better look at him, he would always be gone by the time he got to where he stood. Whenever he broke eye contact, the gray man would find the opportunity to slip away. Then Billy would be standing alone, wondering where he went. I remember the breeze that came when he told us. A shiver ran down my spine as Amy and I looked around us. The empty windows of buildings stared back. Amy tried to laugh it off, telling Billy that he had got us for the first time in a long while. But Billy didn't stop there. Looking at the photo now, Billy looked pretty pale that day. The sun was strong, but Amy and I looked fine. I never released it at the time, but something was up. For all the years since I was pretty sure he used to just tell us these stories as a way of getting stuff out, he didn't want to say. Like I said, friends at that age are people you live by, not always people you want to talk to. I never met his parents and he never talked about them. Instead, he just told stories. He told us that day that he had seen the gray man this morning. Before there had always been others around, he said he could have convinced himself that he had been waiting for someone else. But not that morning. He was alone in his house when the gray man arrived. Outside his bedroom window he stood, a fence separating them, with his face pressed harshly against it. With him closer than ever before, Billy was finally able to get a good look at him. He wore an old coat that looked as if it had been gnawed in places, a look that covered the rest of him. His face was patchy, with sores that seemed to have healed and festered all over again. His skin was gray, darker than any person should be able to be. That's why he got us out so early, he said, to get out of the house. He sneaked out the front door and ran as fast as he could. He thought that if he looked over his shoulder, he'd see him standing right there, with an arm to reach out and grab him. I tried to break the tension by laughing. I hadn't had to do that in a while. But Bill wasn't having it. Instead, he just said three words. He's found me. Amy scoffed and walked off and I turned to call her back. But in doing so, I followed Billy's eyeline and saw where he was looking. 
into the dark windows of one of the abandoned houses behind us. I was sure, mostly sure, that Billy was just messing us around. But then why couldn't I get rid of the goosebumps on my arms? When Amy made it over to us, the pit of my stomach was aching. It really did feel as if we were being watched that day. Not that I really knew how that felt, I guess. But something inside the back of my skull sensed it. Billy stood up and stared us down, telling us that if we thought it was so funny then we would surely be happy to meet the gray man ourselves. Amy called him a creep, but Billy didn't react. Usually it only took one of them to start for them both to be shouting at each other. Instead, he simply pointed his hand at the closest house, the one with the crumbling front wall, and told us to go have a look for ourselves. We had looked inside the buildings before, plenty of graffiti, needles and moss, but had never actually went inside. An unspoken rule we seemed too scared to break until now. Maybe she was just annoyed with Billy or maybe I was being jumpy but Amy disregarded any feelings of concern and pushed past us both, marching straight up to the door. I stood back, eyes darting between my friends. Billy's look was unreadable. His eyes looked tired. Amy had just passed the overgrown front garden, the brown grass passing by knee height. You're just messing us about, right? I asked Billy, but he never answered. He just kept looking ahead, past Amy and at the house. She was in its shadow. The sun had dipped low and it was getting colder. It was no longer just my worry that was causing goosebumps. Hey guys, let's get going. I wanted to call but didn't. I didn't want to make a sound. Amy tired the front door. It swung open into a pitch black hallway. I wanted to take a step forward. I wanted to tell Amy to get back and I wanted Billy to stop messing us around. But I couldn't move. I just stared at my feet and the long shadows that trailed in front of us. But with Amy at the door, why was there three shadows? I screamed. Not a shout, but a scream. I remember that vividly. That's when the shadow reached out, out a hand toward me. Billy must have heard me scream because the next thing I knew, we were both hopping the nearest fence together and running off across the field, breathing hard despite having barely started. It was only seconds into our ran that I felt something at my back. Something was behind us. I heard footsteps, heavy footsteps, just behind us. I ran as hard as I could putting everything I could into just making it across the field to somewhere with people. Not the darkening field we had trapped ourselves in, but Billy said that I imagined the sounds. Later, when we were both hiding at the back of the bin sheds, trying to breathe through our mouths to not smell the mix of rotting food and our own sweat, he told me that he had seen who it was, and it wasn't the gray man. Apparently some guy walking his dog must have seen us trying to get into the house and came over to give us a telling off. That's when I screamed and sent us all running. I tried to lie and say I never screamed, but he didn't believe me. He heard me. Regardless of how much braver than me Billy said he was, he still ran. And he stayed with me in that bin shed until long after the street lights came on. Terrified that some neighbor had called the police and they'd be lying in wait of us. That's when I knew we had to make a move. Our hiding spot was directly below a street lamp, so it had turned from a bunker to a podium with its very own spotlight. It sounds silly writing it down, but I was genuinely terrified of being brought back to mine by the police over breaking into that house. Being an accessory to it anyway. Billy must have felt the same because he was still sweating hours later and keeping a much more fastidious lookout than I did through the slits of the bin shed. Come on, man, I said. We need to go home or our dads will definitely know something's up. But Billy wouldn't move. He just told me to go ahead if I wanted. I didn't. If we went together it'd be okay, but despite it only being a story, I didn't want to walk back in front of those houses. It was that or an extra 20 minute detour that would absolutely get me questioned when I got home. And I was always terrible at lying. With very little choice I told Billy I'd see him soon and took off. I peered over my shoulder as I turned the corner and saw him still there, staring at me through the bike shed, hair gone white from the street light shinning down on top of him. That was the last time I ever saw Billy. On the walk home I really started to regret not bringing a jacket. 
I never expected to out so late. The sweat from the run was mostly dry, but my hair was still damp, making me very aware of every small gust of wind. The streets were quiet. It almost seemed as if everyone had vanished. A thought I might have believed if not for the occasional sound of a loud television through a window or a distant dog bark. I picked up the pace as I approached the park and kept my head low, thinking that if I never looked at the houses that it would be like they were never there. It almost worked. I had made it to the exit gate of park when I heard the creak. I'm not sure why I turned round. Maybe I was just so tired from running or something had reached out from behind me compelling me to look. The house was exactly how we left it. Only now its shadows were complete black holes. That included the shadow of its open door. The door creaked inward, revealing the unseeable rest of the house. I turned my back to it, before I could see anything crawling out of that black pit, and before it could see me. I used what little energy I had left to run the last few streets to my house. I never saw anyone else for the entire run, but that was probably due to me being so determined to get home. I never once looked anywhere but straight ahead. I just plowed straight home and into my room. I hid under my covers that night like a little kid. Even with my widow closed I could still hear the night. Every little breeze sounded like a voice calling to me, and every fox rustling through the hedges was the gray man coming to get me. But nothing ever did. Thankfully, no gray man ever got a hold of me. We were off from school on a break at the time, so I didn't have to go back for another week. In my head, that time was the perfect opportunity to let the heat die down. So I spent it mostly in my bedroom, playing on my PS2 and reading comics. I tucked the photo we had taken into one of my comics and soon forgot about it. I must have pocketed it in the excitement. It was a pretty good week from what I remember. Everything a kid my age could ask for. There was a small incident that I had forgotten about until writing this, however. One morning I heard my dad's voice outside. Peering through the curtains I saw that he was talking to a police officer. I instantly hid, sure that they had tracked me down, but nothing ever came of it. I never asked my dad and he ever told. I think at the time I thought we were having arguments with our neighbor to the right. My dad had always hated him, and they'd came close to a fight more than once. With that in mind, it didn't seem that strange to me when we moved so soon after. I never even got to go back to school. It didn't seem weird, that was, until I found that photo. It fell out from that comic, relighting all these memories of being a kid. But once I got a proper look at it, I knew I had to phone my dad straight away. Amy, Billy, and I were lined up in the middle of the park, each pulling a different stupid expression for the camera. Behind us, the row of houses looked on, and in the window of a very specific house, there appeared to be a dark shape looming. I wasn't even sure what I was going to say to my dad, but the rumbling in my gut made me want some connection to those times, for him to tell me to get a grip, like he usually did when I was being stupid. He was surprised when he picked up the phone, not expecting a call from me so early, but his initial confrontational tone changed when he heard me talking about that day in the park. It was what he said next that made me write this post. I had to get everything down, just to get the events through my head, to try come to some understanding about why I had missed the obvious so much. He asked me a simple question that had, had been lost in all the excitement of that day. Did I ever see Amy come back out from that house? I didn't respond at first, the last decade seeming to shimmer around me. Apparently she had gone missing that day. They thought she ran away at first, something that was corroborated when they found Billy hiding out in the bin sheds after a day of searching. It seemed as if they had scared each other with a story about a gray man and had both not wanted to go home. They had decided the same with Billy a few weeks later when he didn't come home for a final time. My dad said that they had wanted to talk to me but he hadn't let them, for fear of traumatizing me at a young age. So we just moved away, moved away from my friends and whatever had happened to them. I didn't wait to hear more of his explanation, simply hanging up the phone and sitting starting off into space for a few hours. They may have never been real friends, but they were felt like it at the time, and the tragedy of whatever happened to them fills me with just as much melancholy as fear.
I came so close to going missing with them, but maybe I could have done something to help them. If my feet would have let me move and tell Amy to stop, or if my dad would have let me tell the police where they may have been. How long were they in that house? Are they still? As I sit and wonder about this, I'm becoming increasingly paranoid. The hairs on my neck won't let me turn to the computer to type for long before I have to turn and scan my still empty living room. I've had to pull the curtains closed. Call it silly, but whoever is standing at the bus stop across from my flat has been there for a long time, letting many buses pass them by. And from this distance, and the morning haze, their skin is looking gray. I've been looking at an old photo of my friends and I for a while now. It fell out from a volume of Hellblazer that's seen much better days. That comic itself has been collecting dust in the back of my cupboard for years now. It only ever saw the light of day again now with it coming out and move. It happened rather quickly, me moving out of my dad's and into my own place. I won't go into it here, but it had to happen. The quick move left me throwing most of my stuff into boxes without much regard for what it was. I just knew that I didn't want to go back so left nothing to return to. That's how an old comic I haven't even thought about in years ended up in my new house, and the photo inside of it. It was a photo of me and my friends. A photo of me and my friends from about nine years ago back when those were my friends. They were the kind of friends you have at ten years old, whoever lived closest. Looking back, I'm not sure we ever really got on. We even came up with a game that was pretty much just an excuse to fight each other in a park, copying wrestling moves we had seen on the television to see how much they really hurt. A lot. But at the time there was nothing else we wanted to do than get out of our houses and find any excuse not to go home. That's where the photo was taken, at the park in our estate, early on a Saturday morning. We all lived further out than the park which itself was surrounded by some abandoned houses, their windows boarded up with those metal sheets, with holes in them just big enough to see through. The park was small, with just a couple swings and a bit of astroturf grass that looked like it used to hold some climbing frames long yanked out. We weren't sure why those were the houses that got abandoned, when they seemed pretty similar to the rest of the council builds around us. It was exactly the same as my house, only a couple streets away. One of my friends, Billy, used to make up all sorts of different stories about what happened to them. Built on a sinkhole, home to termites, and most credibly, they were just really susceptible to damp and mold. They certainly smelled of it. That throat-catching smell used to waft over the park whenever the wind caught them. If I think about it too much about it, I can still taste it at the back of my throat. Despite that, it was still the best place to hang about back then. The underpass by my house was full of people smoking and hiding from the rain. A pastime we'd discover in the coming years, but currently wasn't that interesting. And the football pitch at the other side of the estate was the hangout of a group of people we never mocked too loudly. The park was the perfect place to sit and get bored. Billy was the perfect friend to have around when you were bored. It was him that came up with most of the games we played, but most importantly, he was always coming up with different stories about our state. He got the nickname Grimm at school. One of the characters from a cartoon that was on at the time was called Billy. Grimm Adventures of Billy and Mandy. And with him being tall and lanky, it was a quick connection. To be fair to him, he turned it around to the idea that he was called that for always telling sick stories. It was such a good turn that we almost actually believed it. It was him, Amy, and myself in the park the day the photo was taken on Amy's camera that she got for Christmas. It was a Kodak film camera, so we only had a few shots at it. The first had messed up when the camera fell, so we hoped that the second had turned out okay. Luckily, it did. The three of us making stupid poses lined up in front of the row of abandoned houses actually looks somewhat thought out composition-wise. We were sitting around admiring it when Billy started telling his story. The story about the gray man. The story seemed to come from nowhere. Billy suddenly finding this burst of motivation to start speaking. As he told it, the gray man was an older guy, around 50 or so, who would watch people on the street. Amy and I laughed at him. An old man watching you was a bit weird, 
but we've defiantly seen weirder. The week prior, I had saw a guy arguing with his dog outside of the corner shop, but Billy persisted. That's probably why I still remember what he supposedly looked like to this day. The detail that he went into was a lot, even for Billy. He said that he had seen him everywhere he went recently. He was a few blocks down from the bus stop beside the corner shop fence and standing alone in the field next to our school. He was always there, standing, never following, but always watching. Whenever he tried to get a better look at him, he would always be gone by the time he got to where he stood. Whenever he broke eye contact, the gray man would find the opportunity to slip away. Then Billy would be standing alone, wondering where he went. I remember the breeze that came when he told us. A shiver ran down my spine as Amy and I looked around us. The empty windows of buildings stared back. Amy tried to laugh it off, telling Billy that he had got us for the first time in a long while. But Billy didn't stop there. Looking at the photo now, Billy looked pretty pale that day. The sun was strong, but Amy and I looked fine. I never released it at the time, but something was up. For all the years since I was pretty sure he used to just tell us these stories as a way of getting stuff out, he didn't want to say. Like I said, friends at that age are people you live by, not always people you want to talk to. I never met his parents and he never talked about them. Instead, he just told stories. He told us that day that he had seen the gray man this morning. Before there had always been others around, he said he could have convinced himself that he had been waiting for someone else. But not that morning. He was alone in his house when the gray man arrived. Outside his bedroom window he stood, a fence separating them, with his face pressed harshly against it. With him closer than ever before, Billy was finally able to get a good look at him. He wore an old coat that looked as if it had been gnawed in places, a look that covered the rest of him. His face was patchy, with sores that seemed to have healed and festered all over again. His skin was gray, darker than any person should be able to be. That's why he got us out so early, he said, to get out of the house. He sneaked out the front door and ran as fast as he could. He thought that if he looked over his shoulder, he'd see him standing right there, with an arm to reach out and grab him. I tried to break the tension by laughing. I hadn't had to do that in a while. But Bill wasn't having it. Instead, he just said three words. He's found me. Amy scoffed and walked off and I turned to call her back. But in doing so, I followed Billy's eyeline and saw where he was looking. Into the dark windows of one of the abandoned houses behind us. I was sure, mostly sure, that Billy was just messing us around. But then why couldn't I get rid of the goosebumps on my arms? When Amy made it over to us, the pit of my stomach was aching. It really did feel as if we were being watched that day. Not that I really knew how that felt, I guess. But something inside the back of my skull sensed it. Billy stood up and stared us down, telling us that if we thought it was so funny, then we would surely be happy to meet the gray man ourselves. Amy called him a creep, but Billy didn't react. Usually it only took one of them to start for them both to be shouting at each other. Instead, he simply pointed his hand at the closest house, the one with the crumbling front wall, and told us to go have a look for ourselves. We had looked inside the buildings before, plenty of graffiti, needles, and moss, but had never actually went inside. An unspoken rule we seemed too scared to break until now. Maybe she was just annoyed with Billy, or maybe I was being jumpy, but Amy disregarded any feelings of concern and pushed past us both, marching straight up to the door. I stood back, eyes darting between my friends. Billy's look was unreadable. His eyes looked tired. Amy had just passed the overgrown front garden, the brown grass passing by knee height. You're just messing us about, right? I asked Billy, but he never answered. He just kept looking ahead, past Amy and at the house. She was in its shadow. The sun had dipped low and it was getting colder. It was no longer just my worry that was causing goosebumps. Hey guys, let's get going. I wanted to call but didn't. I didn't want to make a sound. Amy tired the front door. It swung open into a pitch black hallway. I wanted to take a step forward. 
I wanted to tell Amy to get back and I wanted Billy to stop messing us around. But I couldn't move. I just stared at my feet and the long shadows that trailed in front of us. But with Amy at the door, why was there three shadows? I screamed. Not a shout, but a scream. I remember that vividly. That's when the shadow reached out, out a hand toward me. Billy must have heard me scream because the next thing I knew we were both hopping the nearest fence together and running off across the field, breathing hard despite having barely started. It was only seconds into our ran that I felt something at my back. Something was behind us. I heard footsteps, heavy footsteps, just behind us. I ran as hard as I could, putting everything I could into just making it across the field to somewhere with people. Not the darkening field we had trapped ourselves in, but Billy said that I imagined the sounds. Later, when we were both hiding at the back of the bin sheds, trying to breathe through our mouths to not smell the mix of rotting food and our own sweat, he told me that he had seen who it was, and it wasn't the gray man. Apparently some guy walking his dog must have seen us trying to get into the house and came over to give us a telling off. That's when I screamed and sent us all running. I tried to lie and say I never screamed, but he didn't believe me. He heard me. Regardless of how much braver than me Billy said he was, he still ran. And he stayed with me in that bin shed until long after the street lights came on, terrified that some neighbor had called the police and they'd be lying in wait of us. That's when I knew we had to make a move. Our hiding spot was directly below a street lamp, so it had turned from a bunker to a podium with its very own spotlight. It sounds silly writing it down, but I was genuinely terrified of being brought back to mind by the police over breaking into that house, being an accessory to it anyway. Billy must have felt the same because he was still sweating hours later and keeping a much more fastidious lookout than I did through the slits of the bin shed. Come on, man, I said. We need to go home or our dads will definitely know something's up. But Billy wouldn't move. He just told me to go ahead if I wanted. I didn't. If we went together it'd be okay, but despite it only being a story, I didn't want to walk back in front of those houses. It was that or an extra 20 minute detour that would absolutely get me questioned when I got home. And I was always terrible at lying. With very little choice I told Billy I'd see him soon and took off. I peered over my shoulder as I turned the corner and saw him still there, staring at me through the bike shed, hair gone white from the street light shinning down on top of him. That was the last time I ever saw Billy. On the walk home I really started to regret not bringing a jacket. I never expected to out so late. The sweat from the run was mostly dry but my hair was still damp, making me very aware of every small gust of wind. The streets were quiet. It almost seemed as if everyone had vanished. A thought I might have believed if not for the occasional sound of a loud television through a window or a distant dog bark. I picked up the pace as I approached the park and kept my head low, thinking that if I never looked at the houses that it would be like they were never there. It almost worked. I had made it to the exit gate of park when I heard the creak. I'm not sure why I turned round. Maybe I was just so tired from running or... Something had reached out from behind me, compelling me to look. The house was exactly how we left it. Only now, its shadows were complete black holes. That included the shadow of its open door. The door creaked inward, revealing the unseeable rest of the house. I turned my back to it, before I could see anything crawling out of that black pit, and before it could see me. I used what little energy I had left to run the last few streets to my house. I never saw anyone else for the entire run, but that was probably due to me being so determined to get home. I never once looked anywhere but straight ahead. I just plowed straight home and into my room. I hid under my covers that night like a little kid. Even with my widow closed I could still hear the night. Every little breeze sounded like a voice calling to me, and every fox rustling through the hedges was the gray man coming to get me. But nothing ever did. Thankfully, no gray man ever got a hold of me. We were off from school on a break at the time, so I didn't have to go back for another week. In my head, that time was the perfect opportunity to let the heat die down, so I spent it mostly in my bedroom, 
playing on my PS2 and reading comics. I tucked the photo we had taken into one of my comics and soon forgot about it. I must have pocketed it in the excitement. It was a pretty good week from what I remember. Everything a kid my age could ask for. There was a small incident that I had forgotten about until writing this, however. One morning I heard my dad's voice outside. Peering through the curtains I saw that he was talking to a police officer. I instantly hid, sure that they had tracked me down, but nothing ever came of it. I never asked my dad and he ever told. I think at the time I thought we were having arguments with our neighbor to the right. My dad had always hated him, and they'd came close to a fight more than once. With that in mind, it didn't seem that strange to me when we moved so soon after. I never even got to go back to school. It didn't seem weird, that was, until I found that photo. It fell out from that comic, relighting all these memories of being a kid. But once I got a proper look at it, I knew I had to phone my dad straight away. Amy, Billy, and I were lined up in the middle of the park, each pulling a different stupid expression for the camera. Behind us, the row of houses looked on, and in the window of a very specific house, there appeared to be a dark shape looming. I wasn't even sure what I was going to say to my dad, but the rumbling in my gut made me want some connection to those times, for him to tell me to get a grip, like he usually did when I was being stupid. He was surprised when he picked up the phone, not expecting a call from me so early, but his initial confrontational tone changed when he heard me talking about that day in the park. It was what he said next that made me write this post. I had to get everything down, just to get the events through my head, to try come to some understanding about why I had missed the obvious so much. He asked me a simple question that had, had been lost in all the excitement of that day. Did I ever see Amy come back out from that house? I didn't respond at first, the last decade seeming to shimmer around me. Apparently she had gone missing that day. They thought she ran away at first, something that was corroborated when they found Billy hiding out in the bin sheds after a day of searching. It seemed as if they had scared each other with a story about a gray man and had both not wanted to go home. They had decided the same with Billy a few weeks later when he didn't come home for a final time. My dad said that they had wanted to talk to me but he hadn't let them, for fear of traumatizing me at a young age. So we just moved away, moved away from my friends and whatever had happened to them. I didn't wait to hear more of his explanation, simply hanging up the phone and sitting starting off into space for a few hours. They may have never been real friends, but they were felt like it at the time, and the tragedy of whatever happened to them fills me with just as much melancholy as fear. I came so close to going missing with them, but maybe I could have done something to help them. If my feet would have let me move and tell Amy to stop, or if my dad would have let me tell the police where they may have been. How long were they in that house? Are they still? As I sit and wonder about this, I'm becoming increasingly paranoid. The hairs on my neck won't let me turn to the computer to type for long before I have to turn and scan my still empty living room. I've had to pull the curtains closed. Call it silly, but whoever is standing at the bus stop across from my flat has been there for a long time, letting many buses pass them by. And from this distance, and the morning haze, their skin is looking gray. I remember the day my mom had called me and asked that I come home from work early. The request wasn't one I took lightly as the reason surely wasn't a good one. And to nobody's surprise, it wasn't. I walked into our small ranch home to see my mother in tears with my cousin consoling her. She looked up at me with defeat in her eyes and revealed that my grandmother had passed away suddenly. The news was upsetting, but upon instantly recalling the kind of person my grandma was, I couldn't say I was entirely surprised. After the funeral about a week later, it was time for us to go and collect her things from her home, which was set to auctioned off next week. We dreaded the idea because her home was littered from wall to ceiling with junk and clutter. Calling my grandma a hoarder is most definitely an understatement. Walls were lined with old pictures of families we didn't even know, and some still had old price tags on them from when she would buy them at garage sales and flea markets. Porcelain dolls lined shelves upon shelves of dusty and dirty glassware from who knows when. 
Everything in the house seemed to be staring at us with almost sinister intent. Some figures and paintings even looked frightened and scared of one another. I could go on about what sort of vibes and auras came from the house, but unfortunately, that isn't why I'm writing this. We were maybe three hours into sorting through boxes upon boxes, when we heard a small coo come from a dark corner of the house. I almost jumped, I admit, but when a small tin of plastic army soldiers got knocked over, we knew we weren't alone in the house. Mom shot me a confused glance as I walked over to investigate the commotion. At first, I couldn't see anything out of the ordinary, just old picture frames and cardboard boxes, but then something stuck out at me. Two tiny yellow eyes were stalking my movement from underneath an end table. The small creature slowly crawled its way into the dimly lit room just enough to make out what exactly was watching over me. A small black cat with ragged and patchy fur stopped and sat still by my feet. It had coarse and rough fur that almost didn't cover its whole body. It had specks of white on the tips of each strand that almost made it seem like it was graying like an old person. I knelt down to meet the creature at its level and extended a hand to the feline to offer a gesture of friendship. The cat let out a low purr and brushed its head against my hand as it turned and walked away towards the kitchen. I asked my mom if she knew about grandma having a cat, but she told me she didn't know of one. She just explained that old ladies take in anything and everything off the street, and that she's surprised it wasn't a raccoon. I shrugged, but it dawned on me that we can't just leave the animal alone to fend for itself. Sure, it survived this long, but it still doesn't make it ethical. I asked my mom if she would take it, but she told me she was allergic to cats, meaning this small problem was now my small problem. I decided I'd grab the cat and take it home until I could find an owner. The only problem was the animal was nowhere to be seen. I searched every nook and cranny, but I found nothing but junk and grime. I stumbled upon a crack in the wall around seven inches wide, just big enough for a cat to slip through. The wall around it had claw makes stretching towards the ceiling, but some of them were far taller than that small cat could reach. I figured it was a well-traveled path for many animals, so I didn't think anything of it. I made a few calls and noises into the opening, but nothing ever emerged. I figured I would just look for the cat tomorrow when we returned, so I got my mother, and we headed home for the evening. The next morning, me and my mother once again returned to the house to sort through more junk. When we arrived, I noticed a tiny critter was standing in the front window, peering out at us. It was the cat from before. I opened the door to the home, and the cat swiftly pounced over to me and seemed quite excited that I was there. It rubbed all over my ankles as I walked, nearly tripping me with every step. It made a small jingle as it pranced around, and I noticed a tiny leather collar surrounding the cat's neck. It had a gold medallion with the name Tiny on it. My mother saw the cat and immediately questioned its strange fur pattern. I decided to research it, and the picture I used to reverse search gave me pages upon pages of information about a cat breed known as a Lycoi. The cat's name actually translates into wolf cat, due its mangy but perfectly healthy and natural appearance. While mom sorted through more boxes, I grew more accustomed to my newfound sidekick. The cat wouldn't leave me alone no matter what. I couldn't even sneak to the restroom without it following me. When the sun began to set and twilight stretched over the sky, we knew it was time to retreat from the mess once again and go home. As I was about to leave, I noticed the cat wasn't following in my shadow anymore. The animal was actually making a quick stride toward the crack in the wall that I presumed it had gone yesterday making a dash to stop it from escaping again. I snatched it up from the ground and held it tight so that I could get it home safely and be able to properly care for it. The cat began to claw at me and call out wildly. I expected this but knew it was for the animal's own good, as who knows what kind of poisons or hazardous materials it could get into. I put the cat in my car and it quickly hid underneath the passenger seat in a defense position. That night when we got home, Tiny made his way through my home, inspecting his surroundings and looking, and almost seemed intent on looking for something. The animal gave up after an hour and hid behind my couch. I figured I would give it the night to get accustomed to its temporary home before trying to get involved. So I poured a bowl of cat food I purchased on the way home and made my way to bed. As I laid my head down, I could have sworn I'd heard meowing through the house, but assumed it was likely just a curious cat exploring this strange new world. I just wondered why it was so loud. When I woke up the next morning and walked out to the living room, I almost dropped my phone where I was standing. My living room was torn apart, 
Tables and chairs were knocked over. Massive gashes were made in the couch and armchair. I picked up my phone and dialed 911 to tell the police about a break-in. When an officer arrived to take notes of what had happened, he seemed just as confused as I was. Things were torn apart like a stampede had just gone through, but nothing was missing. Granted, most of what was left was in pieces, but it was still technically accounted for nonetheless. The officer said he would look for any local cameras to see if anybody snuck in overnight, but that there was no evidence of a break-in, as my door and windows were all intact and still locked. As the officer left, I noticed a small creature stroll out from behind my fridge. It was tiny, and he walked with an almost injured limp over to his food bowl and finished off the last of kibble left in his bowl from last night. He walked over sorely to the chair and jumped up on it and sat down. Of course, the thought had crossed my mind that Tiny was behind the destruction, but the thought of him walked around with a machete and crowbar made me chuckle. I decided I'd go for a walk to put this behind me and thought maybe Tiny would want to join me, so I took a piece of thin rope and tied around his collar for a makeshift leash. As I started to walk, I noticed something. Tiny wasn't limping anymore, as a matter of fact, he seemed rather spry. That night, things took a turn for the worse. Around 7 o'clock, Tiny acted both injured and sick. He wasn't nearly as lively as he was this morning, and he had a hunched back and returned to limping again. He was antisocial and insisted on hiding all night. I wanted to keep a close eye on him, so I decided to put his food bowl in my room and shut the door with both of us inside. I truly wish I had just let me hide where he wanted. As I turned out the light... Tiny was hiding under my desk, meowing and growling like crazy. I figured I would give him a moment to stop, but tomorrow would be an immediate trip to the vet. About ten minutes passed in the dark before I heard him begin to growl once again. This time it was new, it was in a much lower and pained tone. I heard the chair by desk fall over from what I assumed was a rather restless Tiny, but my heart sank to my feet from what followed next. Tiny jumped up onto my bed, but this was no mere cat that had landed on my legs. The sheer weight of the figure rivaled that of a human being. It almost knocked me out of the bed altogether. I felt large paws that seemed like hands slowly crawl up my body. I froze with a sense of sleep paralysis as I felt large breaths waft over my neck, followed by a low purr that seemed like a growl. I didn't want to move. I wanted to call the police or the turn on the light, but I knew what I would see wouldn't be something I could forget. I felt a sudden shift in weight followed by a loud yet careful thud hit the floor with a sudden strike. The thing had jumped off of my bed and left me alone. I was still too scared to move and knew that the being was still stuck in my room due to the door being shut. But the thought was interrupted by a crashing noise against my door. It sounded like it was charging directly into the exit to force its way out. I then heard loud and fast scratches like nails dragging across rough wood. Every swipe made an ear-splitting noise that made my frozen state worsen. Finally, I heard a yanking noise followed by the door swinging open violently. It crashed against the wall with the force of freight train, and I heard the thud of feet stalk out the rest of the house and down the hallway. I almost gathered the courage to move my leg, but then I heard the thing call out from the other end of the house. It was a menacing and almost threatening call that sounded like a beast was trying to mimic a cat's meow. I then heard it begin to beat on the front door and struggle for moments before it finally beeshed through. The house immediately fell silent so I knew the beast had made it out of the house. I raced to turn on the lights and noticed my desk chair was flipped over and claw marks surrounding my desk. My bedroom door was nearly turned to shreds with markings and indentations covering it. I walked out to my living room to see my front door was completely smashed and laying on my front porch. I wanted to call the police again, but knew they would gain unwanted suspicions if I called about the same issue. What would I tell them? That my cat turned into a monster and ran away? I would rather not spend the night in jail for suspicion of drug use. I couldn't sleep after trying my best to repair the damages. I recall turning on the TV to a breaking news story of multiple assaults and break-ins. A man was apparently even killed overnight in a parking garage. His body was mutilated almost beyond recognition and his possessions were stolen. I feared knowing that the perpetrator could have been the thing that was tiny, but knew the thought would only bring me distress. Tried shrugging it off as a crime spree from some maniac, preferably one without fur and whiskers. I needed some fresh air so I decided to step out to my backyard and drink a cup of coffee to forget the last night's events. After all, 
Due to lack of sleep, I couldn't remember what was real and what could have been a simple nightmare. But then I noticed something. Next to my patio was a small stack of objects. They had a brilliant shine and stuck out like a sore thumb. The pile consisted of rings and jewelry. There were purses and wallets with entire stacks of cash laying around them. There were easily thousands of dollars just sitting there, not counting the value of the physical items. I stood frozen wondering how they ended up in my yard, but froze as I came to realize that some of these items I recognized from the news. The man who was killed? His wallet was sitting in the pile, with flecks of red still covering it. I didn't know what to do, but felt something bruise against my leg. It was tiny just as he was when I first found him. Small, lively, and cute in an ugly sort of way. His color reflected gold onto the ground below. I didn't know what to do. If I were to call the police, they would arrest me on the spot. They wouldn't believe that I had just found the night's crimes neatly piled in my backyard. But I didn't have time to dwell before a knock hit my front door. It was a police officer and a detective. They asked what had happened to my front door and I told them that my house was broken into again last night. They actually had come to follow up on the previous night's events, specifically about having an update on my initial call. They asked a series of questions that I either didn't know or lied about to cover my own tale. Tiny jumped up to one of the detectives and sniffed around before hissing at him and then running away to hide. He didn't seem too fond of them. The police had asked me to lock my doors and windows at night in case I hadn't already done so, and said the neighborhood is under a temporary curfew following the night's events, and that travel was only advised if absolutely necessary, and to not travel alone or without some form of protection. I thanked them for their time and they left. As soon as they left, Tiny pranced out almost happily. I stared at the cat as he stared back, almost as if he knew that I knew what he had done. I decided to go and inspect my grandmother's house to track down any background of this feline imposter. I searched the house for hours but found nothing. No adoption papers, no cat supplies. It was as if grandma hadn't owned him at all. I decided the only place left to look was where he had come from initially. I walked over to the crack in the wall to inspect it. I knew I couldn't fit, but considering the state of the house I knew one hole wouldn't make a difference. So I grabbed a nearby hammer and smashed a wider opening in the wall. The crawl space it led into was dark and musty, with dead mice all around it. I noticed a small wooden box was tucked away in the corner, so grabbed it and backed out of the hole. There was a golden latch that almost perfectly matched the gold of Tiny's collar. I opened it to reveal a small sheet of paper was inside, but nothing else. The writing was old, very old. It seemed to be written in ink with a quill on yellowed and decaying paper. It read as follows. To whom it may concern, the companion you have just acquired was secured in an expedition to the Gobi Desert. While its true origins are unknown, the animal is wise beyond its means and possess a nearly impossible trait. Upon feeding the animal, it forms a bond with its caretaker and offers a rather sinful and monstrous service in return. One night a week, the animal will take on a form that is neither of God nor beast, and will retrieve riches and possessions for its caretaker no matter the means. It has slain innocent men in the night and upon our travels, killed half a village of natives and piled its stolen plunder in our own satchels and baggage. A few of my men have seen the beast in its altered form and refuse to speak of it. I issue this letter as a warning to all those who may cross paths with the beast. May God not blame you for its own misdeeds. Enclosed with the letter was an old photograph of a wooded area at night, but in the center of the picture stood a being nearly six feet tall. It had dark and scraggly fur with hunched legs and a loose and long tail that dragged the ground behind it. It had piercing yellow eyes that seemed to glare into my soul. It had a wide and sharp grin that seemed so uncanny that I couldn't tell whether it was smiling or screaming. Its claws were long and slightly resembled human hands, but still was quite discernible from them. It stood on two legs in a position that seemed like it was going to pounce at any second. What stood out to me the most, however, was the tightly fit collar on it, with a gold coin that hung just beneath its neck. I held the letter in shock, knowing that if last night hadn't happened I wouldn't believe it myself. I made my way home and was greeted by a sleeping tiny sprawled across the arm of my chair. 
I sat down and stared at the sleeping animal. I thought through the events of last night and wondered how long it would take the police to trace this back to me and my newfound thief. But I realized that at least for the time being, I wasn't a suspect, I was a victim. The police had thought my house was just another home in a chain of crimes. After all, I would be accounted for all night as it wasn't me who would be out painting the town red. I mean I could use the money that was found after all. As I'm writing this, I now live in a secluded area of Northeast America. I now possess a fully restored Victorian home on 45 acres of property with multiple estates across the country. I've been investigated a few times, but there's never been any proof of wrongdoing. As a matter of fact, I pride myself of how well I've hidden my side gig. It's that day of the week again, which means I suspect Tiny will be shedding some fur and playing fetch in the next few hours. To anybody who has fallen victim to my actions, I truly do apologize. It isn't personal, I assure you, but the way I see it, it's better to have control over the animal myself than risk it coming and turning on me. I'm sure you understand, right?